Hi, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are and when you're watching this. My name is Melissa Zhang. I'm a postdoc at UGA. And if you can't see, that's what the little, the words here say. Um, today, I'm going to give a series of two talks corresponding to two halves of a paper I wrote with a whole bunch of people, Carmen Capral, um, Nicole Gonzalez, Christine Lee, um, Adam Lawrence, and Ramila Sostanovich. And um, the paper is um, published in the proceedings um, of WISCON, which is a conference we had, a workshop we had once. Um, so I'll, I'll first start with the fact that um, this is going to be fairly quick because nobody's asking me questions live, but I encourage everyone who has any questions to come to my office hours. I'll also be online to answer questions, but um, my office hours are kind of early because I'm, I have some like moving business to do at the end of June. Okay. So as I said, the talk comes in two parts. So for the first 25 minutes, I will be talking about um, some bounds on or some obstructions on ribbon concordance coming from SLN homologies, specifically the ones that come from web and foam constructions. So these are very tangible um, visual um, versions of SLN homology. Um, as opposed to the more general construction using matrix factorizations. In part two, I will talk about um, bounds on other types of distances between knots. So um, we're going to be talking about distances between a knot and let's say the, the set of alternating knots and so on via crossing changes. And these bounds are going to be coming from the page on um, in a spectral sequence where um, the torsion basically dies off. Okay, so part one. This is going to have a lot of material and I will skip over a bunch of the notes as needed, but um, you will hopefully be able to ask me questions once you actually talk to me. So let's start with what Havana homology is. And I want to take the point of view where we're thinking of Havana homology as a TQFT specifically coming from a Frobenius system. So you're supposed to think about um, a one plus one TQFT as coming from, it's assigning some vector space to one dimensional manifolds. And since my manifolds are closed here, such as knots and such, um, they're going to be drawn as circles in my very simplified cartoon. And then whenever you have a cobordism between knots, you can think about it and realize that there are only really four possibilities, right? You can have a circle being born and then a circle dying off. So these are represented by the cobordism that is a cup and a cap. And then you can have these uh, merging and splitting situations. So one circle becomes two and two circles become one. And there is a correspondence between rank two Frobenius systems and TQFTs, one plus one TQFTs. So the maps for these four elementary pieces are going to be correspond to, corresponding to operations on here. So there's the inclusion map of the base ring into an algebra. And then there's the co-unit. So this is called a unit, this is a co-unit that actually takes your algebra and evaluates it to the base ring. And then multiplication is as you expect. You can take two copies of the algebra and you multiply it within the algebra. And then the interesting thing is there's this dual operation called co-multiplication where you have one element in the algebra and you can split it into a tensor product of two of them. Okay, so I want to think about these as a movie because what's going to happen is that we're going to be living in the third dimension, just thinking about these circles. So to add the fourth dimension in, we have to think about it as time. So the birth of a circle is there's nothing here, and then there's a point, and then there's a circle. Um, and if you have the time, you can think about the other three cases by pausing the video. So now let's talk about what Kavanaugh homology is. 
Covalent homology is what I described above, except that we're using a specific um, Frobenius system. So just for now, let's, oops, let's imagine our base ring to be the integers. And then the algebra is going to be the polynomial ring modded out by x squared. So this is actually just two dimensional or rank two as a uh, module over Z. Um, the rough idea is that this is related to the Jones polynomial. So you have this, uh, this sort of higher level version of um, resolving and thinking about scaling relations. So if you have any crossing like this, there's two ways to resolve the crossing into so that there's no more crossing. And we're going to call that zero and one. Um, this will also show up in the, the second part of the talk. So for example, if you have a diagram of the unknot, you can take all of its complete resolutions. So this is indexed by um, just a zero because for your one crossing, you um, resolved it according to the zero rule. And then here's the one where you do it the other way. Now, if you change the resolution at a single crossing, you'll realize that only one of two things happens. Either you have two circles merging together, which is the case in this picture, or you have the opposite situation where you're actually um, splitting up one circle into two. And so Khovanov defines the, um, the maps. Well, since we're using this algebra, multiplication already comes for free. You just multiply inside this algebra. Um, you can also define the co-unit, um, and it has to, of course, satisfy some relations um, or some restrictions. But basically, you just define n and you define delta, which is the, the co-multiplication, and you have um, a rank two Frobenius system. So that's the homology. I also want to mention that there is a similar definition. Um, it's inspired by work of Lee and Barnaton, but I'm going to state it as what came from Kovanov's paper in 04, which is that you can generalize this by saying, let my base ring have some indeterminates h and t. And instead of saying I'm going to use x squared um, in uh, modding it out in my algebra, let's just say that we have these variables h and t and we'll mod out by this quadratic. Now, when I said rank two earlier, that's related to the two over here. So really we could have used any quadratic in the denominator. So we might as well say, let's take the most general case. Okay, so that just gives a different TQFT. Now, if you're used to thinking about homology, you might usually think about, um, you have some map, maybe like you have a vector space and it has um, maps going in whatever direction, and then you have kernel mod image. But if we want to think about this topologically using the TQFT, we can modify this idea to say that instead of using um, kernel mod image, we're going to use a bilinear form. So bilinear form just means we're going to pair things together. And in our case, it means our surfaces are going to be glued together in the middle. So there's like a top surface, there's a bunch of circles, and then there's a bottom surface, and pairing them together and evaluating that is going to be our bilinear form. So homology under this um, description is just going to be, you take resolutions and all of the surfaces that they bound. So if I have a resolution here, maybe it's just one circle, it can be bound by a whole bunch of different surfaces. But if I mod out by some relations, I get some control over how big the homology can be. So let's just take a look at, um, let's say this guy. So it turns out that in Havana homology, I really want this to be rank two. So there should really be two generators corresponding to this topological object. This is way too many surfaces that have this as a boundary, but they're all actually related to each other because I have this thing called the neck cutting relation. So it just means that there's something I can use to remove genus and relate this guy to you know, some amount of 
things in the ring, and then this object. Okay, so you see these dots here. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much unless you already know this. Um, the dots are sort of related to these genus pieces, and we also have very good control of them because it turns out that whenever you have, oh, I probably should have added this here, but um, it is true that if you have two dots, that's just going to be equal to zero. So the dots are actually related to how many powers of X show up, but I'll just leave it at that. Okay. So now let's think about a higher rank for Benia system. So previously we had Z um, a joined X mod a quadratic. But if you want to think about SLN homology where N is greater than two, it turns out it's the same sort of construction, but the rank is higher. So for, for example, the simplest um, version that's right beyond SL2 homology, which is Havana homology, maybe I should write that down. SL2 homology is Havana homology. Um, you want to mod out by a cubic for SL3 homology. And once you get to higher SL um, and homologies, the technology is not quite there for webs and phones. So it was originally de defined by Havana and Rosansky using matrix factorizations. But for specific potentials, namely the ones that are um, like all have the same root, so this is just a bunch of X's multiplied together, there's actually a description um, using webs and phones. This is by um, Mackay, Turner, and Voss. So if you look at um, what we should think of as a cobordism, it's now actually going to have these singular edges. So previously a pair of pants was a cobordism for SL2 homology. Now I have this extra facet in here. So we're actually looking at trivalent graphs as our one-dimensional things in our TQFT. Now they're called webs. And then the quote unquote cobordisms between them are now foams. So you can think of it as if you have a bunch of bubbles stuck together, you really do see, um, if you slice through it generically, a web trivalent surf, um, graph, and then you only have these singularities where there are three surfaces coming out of a singular arc. Okay. Um, so just as Kavana homology categorifies the um, Jones polynomial, these also categorify SLN link polynomials, which come from um, different skein relations. Um, it's very important since we're working with these um, cobordisms and foams that we know that these theories are functorial. And this is based on work of all of these people in a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes there's a sign uh, indiscrep sorry, a long time ago, a sign discrepancy, and some of these works have um, worked on fixing that. Okay. So as I said before, for SLN, and you use this um, algebra, then you have a web and foam, and maybe with dots. So we're going to use dots in what we're about to prove. So there are more relations when it comes to higher SLN, but the reason why I wanted to show you these couple relations is because that these are the only ones relevant to our ribbon um, concordance obstruction. And you'll notice that this is very similar to what I showed you before for the SL2 case. Basically, you have this genus decreasing piece, which is neck cutting. And now combinatorially, there are more things to do, but it's still very simple. You just basically say, this neck is the same as the sum of all the different ways of putting dots here and here. Um, and then you need something to evaluate, right? Because if you're going to use your bilinear form, you're going to need to close it off close off your phones, and then evaluate to get something in the ring. So these sphere relations are just saying, well, how many dots are allowed on here for me to get a number in the ring, which recall is Z in our case. Um, and then, 
Otherwise, it has to be some other number. Okay, you'll notice that these relations don't actually have any trivalent edges. Um, and that's okay. There are more um, relations that do have the singular edges, but we won't need that for now. Okay, so now we're going to show that all of these theories give an obstruction to a ribbon concordance from one link to another. So let me just quickly go over what it means to have a ribbon concordance, just for those of you who haven't seen this yet. I'm sure you'll see this many times in this conference. So the way I like to think about it is that a knot lives in S3, um, but we can also think of S3 as the boundary of B4. So if you have a surface that is properly embedded inside B4, so its boundary is on the boundary of B4, but it itself is inside B4, or in, its interior is in the interior of B4, then we have a four-dimensional surface whose boundary is a knot. And using this point of view, we can actually make the set of knots into a group, which is extremely exciting because this is so much more structure than we would probably um, automatically assume would happen with something so topological. Um, so what we need to do is mod out by concordance. So what is the group operation? Um, you're basically just connect summing. But once you mod out by concordance, there are actually going to be knots that are equivalent to the unknot, whereas they weren't it, like previously in S3. Okay, so a knot K1 is concordant to a knot K2. If in the fourth dimension, you can basically draw some kind of cylinder that connects them. So here's a cartoon of it. Um, your cylinder could be doing all sorts of crazy things. It's not just a straight shot down because that would just be like you're not cross eye. Um, let's see. So that's what I mean by an annulus. Annulus is like a flattened out cylinder. So I think about it the same way. Um, this is an equivalence relation because if you flip my cylinder upside down, I still have a cylinder. So two knots are just concordant to each other. Okay, so this gives us a knot concordance group, which I'm going to call C. Um, for those of you who care about this, I'm thinking about the smooth one when I write this. Now there's, in a group, there's a very special element called the identity. And since we're actually talking about an abelian group, because um, connect summing knots is also, um, you know, that commutes, um, we want to know what knots are in the equivalence class of the identity element, which is the unknot. So if you connect someone unknot to any other knot, you'll still get that same knot. Um, so this is definitely the identity element. And so we call this set of knots slice. So four dimensionally, they're the simplest. And we can also think of these as those that bound a disk in B4. Um, so it's interesting to think about concordance or um, or sorry, what I'm about to talk about, which is like ribbon concordance, because it's sort of um, related to this question of sliceness. Okay, so here's the motivation for the question. With, within each equivalence class, could you possibly partially order the knots? So are some of them more complicated? Um, Gordon conjectured in 81 that ribbon concordance gives a partial ordering, and I'm about to tell you what ribbon means. Um, so if you think about it, the unknot is very, very simple, but there are all these other knots that are also concordant to it, but they're clearly more complicated than the unknot. So we want to get some sort of relationship, some sort of ordering. So a ribbon concordance the way that I'm going to think about it is just that it's a concordance such that when you draw the movie, it's very happy. So what I mean by happy is that it can only have births and merges. So circles are born and then they meet up and they become friends. This is as opposed to having deaths and splits. 
So Ribbon Concordance is a happy movie. Okay, if you wanna think about it as an actual cobordism, you can just think like, it's good to have this sort of picture where you have a bunch of births. You don't want this cactus because this has a bunch of deaths and also splits. So um, let's just skip this part. Um, there are some classical results. So Gordon proved that if you have, if you think about their pi one and you have a ribbon concordance, then the following is true. You have these kinds of facts. There's some sort of um, injection here into pi ones, and then there's some kind of projection here. So whenever you know something about ribbon concordances, you can use it as an obstruction. So if you can just kind of look at an example and say that one of these is not true, like maybe uh, this guy is way too big compared to this, then you know that there isn't a ribbon concordance. Now in February 2019, Ian Zemke um, started a whole storm of papers that basically depended on a very important topological lemma, which is going to be right here. So he originally showed that if there is a ribbon concordance from K0 to K1, then on not floor homology, you have an injection and it injects as a direct sum end. And a bunch of people have followed up with this and proven a lot of other theories satisfy this. Um, their names are here. I want to point out uh, Sung Kyung Kang's paper because this actually subsumes the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, his method is more general and talks about what types of TQFTs will give this sort of obstruction, whereas our work is going to show you a, a concrete like um, topological picture of what's going on for these SLN home homologies. Okay, and I think it, he's talking in the conference at a different topic group, so check out that talk as well if you're interested. So all of these relied on Zemke's topological lemma, which basically says that if you have a ribbon concordance from L0 to L1, so remember this is a happy movie going from L0 to L1, you can think about flipping that upside down to get the very sad movie. So the movie where you rewind it and it's basically just people splitting up and dying. If you put those together, attaching them at L1 in the middle, so here's L1 and here's L0 and L0, um, he proves that this conglomeration of two surfaces is isotopic to just something that looks like a cylinder from L0 to L0. So I actually mean like you move it around and it looks like a cross I, L0 cross I, with a bunch of oops, spheres tubed on. So what I see here is in terms of the TQFT, there is an identity map. There are these spheres, which I can cut off using the neck relations and then evaluate using the sphere relations. So this is in fact what Levine Zemke do for Kavana homology. They use the SL2 uh, relations and prove that this also gives a ribbon obstruction. So let's talk about our result. This is very much analogous. If your homology theory is any of these, which all have web and foam constructions, then you also get a ribbon concordance obstruction. So we'll get that the homology um, embeds into, oops, I guess I didn't mean to write L1 here, I meant K1. So K0 will embed into K1 as a direct sum and. Um, the reason why I have this I and J here is because all of these theories have a homological and quantum grading. So these are bi-graded, which means you get an obstruction for each of these pieces. So here's the proof sketch. Um, basically, you just have to be very careful about bookkeeping because you have a lot of dots when you do SLN homology. But as before, as with Levine Zemke, you just do neck cutting right here and then evaluate this. And only the one that has n minus one dots will evaluate to one, everything else dies. So if you want to go back and check, this is one of the relations for SLN homology. And then if you evaluate this, 
this is just one, this is just the identity. So that tells you that after doing some bookkeeping, the homology of um, sorry. Right, so that tells you that if I had an original surface F, it's going to give me the same um, map on homology as this guy. So that means that this half of the TQFT, whatever that represents in the uh, abelian groups side, is an inverse to this piece, whatever it represents on the abelian group side. And you can think of it as th that means that one of these pieces is an objective, namely the ribbon piece, and then this other piece is the inverse. So we actually have an embedding of this homology into here as a direct sum end. Okay, so that concludes the first part of my talk. And in the second part, I'll talk about the second part of the paper. Thanks for listening. <laughs>